The Middle East peace process is a term that's been used by world leaders time and time again. It refers to efforts made by the international community to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. One of the most significant events of the past 50 years is the Oslo Accords, a set of agreements that were first signed in 1993 by the government of Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization. It put in place a series of procedures based on UN resolutions for the eventual goal of an independent Palestinian state. And to oversee this agreement, the UN established the Office of the Special Coordinator for the Middle East peace process. The coordinator's mandate is to lead the UN system in all political and diplomatic efforts related to the peace process. But nearly 30 years since its establishment, what impact has it had on Palestinians and Israelis and the broader region? The UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East peace process, Nikolai Maladinov, talks to Al Jazeera. Nikolai Mladenov, UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Can I perhaps start with that, your job title? You are the Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process. Is there actually a Middle East Peace Process right now? No. And uh, I seem to be the only one stuck with it on my business card. Um, there is no Middle East Peace Process. I don't think either the Israeli or the Palestinian side um, for the various different reasons, are in a position to actually currently engage in meaningful negotiations. Um, we've seen over the last uh, few years the international architecture for supporting Israeli-Palestinian negotiations also um, uh, threatened and under pressure. Um, and I feel that a lot of our work currently has focused more on preventing war in Gaza, focusing a lot on preventive diplomacy, preserving the um, consensus internationally as much as possible on how the Israeli-Palestinian conflict can be resolved um, and, and really working quietly to build conditions for the future leadership uh, on both sides to actually, hopefully, come back to the negotiating table in a meaningful manner. President Trump seems to think there's a Middle East peace process. He's put his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, in charge of it. Um, what do you know of the Kushner plan? Is there a Kushner plan even? Well, we haven't seen anything yet. Um, I stay in touch with our American friends quite often. We uh, meet with Jared and, and, and others. And uh, my position to them has always been very clear. If you want to um, come up with a plan that is meaningful, um, one, it should start by saying that Israelis and Palestinians must separate into separate states. That's a very basic premise. Um, and it is not just because that's the consensus in terms of UN resolutions and international law and bilateral agreements, but it's also the only way to, to, to um, achieve the nat natural, if you wish, aspirations for both peoples to have statehood. Um, secondly, it must be in line with what um, UN resolutions and other uh, documents include, and that is pretty much what the consensus for the rest of the world is on how to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian question. And thirdly, it must be done in a way that it brings the parties back to the table. Um, because I don't, and, and perhaps this is just me coming from the Balkans and to the Middle East, um, but I feel very strongly that um, outsiders can help, but they can never do the job for, 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 for other people. And if we have a role to play in, in this conflict, that is to facilitate, to help, uh, but never to impose. Um, and I think this is uh, our constructive advice to our American friends. We still haven't seen any uh, proposal um, on the table, um, but we continue talking to everybody. And what do you think the American position is on that basic idea, a two-state solution? There was that economic conference in Bahrain, and there was no mention there from the American side of an actual sovereign Palestinian state. There was no mention, um, but if you read the conference documents carefully, um, and the proposals that they came up uh, with for the economic development of, uh, of Palestine, you could perhaps see the outline that if you implement all the projects um, that were put on the table, particularly some of them that link the Ga Gaza to the West Bank and others, you could see the, the outline of a future state. 
what I'm concerned with is that when um, uh, the U.S. officially does not want to say the two states is the core of the position um, uh, that they hold, um, that they depart from the uh, consensus that has for a very long time um, ruled uh, internationally how this conflict is resolved. Um, and it also feeds, unfortunately, into the situation on the ground. Because what we have on the ground is, uh, you know, some people will say it's a one-state reality. Um, I will say it's a one-state reality of perpetual occupation and anger and frustration. Um, and that's not a good situation for is both for Palestinians or Israelis. You also see a lot of uh, people today question the very idea that you can untangle Palestinians and Israelis into two separate entities, two states. Um, and say, well, you know, we have to go in a different direction. No longer should we um, um, have the goal of two states. Perhaps we should have one state um, that has equal rights uh, for everyone, Arabs, Jews, Muslims, Christians, everyone. Um, and these discussions, unfortunately, I feel um, are very easy to take hold in, in the public sphere. But if challenged, they really don't answer the very basic questions that both you know, Israelis and Palestinians still face. I remember about two years ago asking your boss, the Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, about the viability now of a two-state solution. And he said, yes, it's still just about viable. That was two years ago. Do you believe it's viable now or have the Israelis built on it? Well, I suppose I should say it's just viable. Um, but the reality is changing on the ground um, every day. Um, and that reality is at all levels. Um, if you look at the facts on the ground, if you see the expansion of settlements, and I don't mean just the physical building of houses, but the infrastructure that accompanies um, the settlements. Um, if you look at uh, the rate of demolition of Palestinian structures um, in Area C, Area C is the area which is under civilian control by Israel of the West Bank, um, you see less and less land. Um, uh, that is available for, 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 for people. Um, if you look, but it's not just the land, it's also the uh, national narratives of both Israelis and Palestinians have gone in very different directions. If in the early 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, um, people were enthusiastic about reaching out to each other and having joint projects and working together, um, now there's a, a, a trend to not talk to each other. Um, and, and this is very um, uh, dangerous. And thirdly, I think very importantly, is the continuing level of violence, uh, which undermines the basic trust between people and also undermines the ability to return um, to, to, uh, to negotiations. Um, and hence, on the Israeli side, I've hardly met an Israeli who doesn't believe that another peace process um, doesn't end up in, in more violence for them, for the Israelis. Um, and I've hardly met a Palestinian who doesn't believe that another peace process ends up in more losses for the Palestinians, or loss of land, or loss of uh, or, or dignity. It makes it a very complicated um, situation. And, and I will admit that it, one does need to think out of the box on how to um, uh, constructively um, re-engage. You talk about out of the box thinking. Clearly, the Kushner plan, if there was one, certainly with regard to the first part in Bahrain, was get the money flowing first, get the economies flowing first. But you've seen that figures in the Palestinian Authority were very dismissive of that. Hamas said Palestine is not for sale. That whole idea is dead in the water, isn't it? Well, I don't, I don't think you can really how should I put it? I don't think you can really convert the, a political issue into just a humanitarian or, a, um, or a, an issue of you know, salaries and economic opportunity. Certainly, the economy is a very major part of it. Um, and if I look at just Gaza uh, as an example of what we as the UN, together with Egypt and others, have done over the last uh, uh, two years, we've actually approached it in a different way. We've said, look, in Gaza, and let me expand a little bit on that, we have a very ser a serious set of problems that may lead us to war. Uh, we've divided these problems into three sets, security issues that need to be addressed, humanitarian issues, development and um, um, getting jobs for people, and Qatar has been critically important in providing support for the UN in that respect, and thirdly, political issues, unity, national unity, um, and a way forward. We need to admit that there is a very serious security challenge on the ground both for Israelis and for Palestinians, uh, whether it's in Gaza or, or, or Israel proper or in uh, the West Bank, very serious security threats. 
uh, ranging from terror to rockets and, um, um, and, and, and uh, arrests and, and, and all kinds of other incidents. There are very serious economic challenges because when the current system that's in place for the Palestinian economy, um, it was designed in 1994, it's uh, quite a long time ago, um, and we're constantly running into bottlenecks for Palestinian development. As you know, President Trump sees these things in very black and white terms. He's a transactional president. He talked, as you know, about the deal of the century. The point man for this, working for him and Jared Kushner, was Jason Greenblatt. He clearly doesn't see there's a deal of the century anytime soon because he quit his role in September. You'd think he'd want to stay around for a deal of the century. Given that this Kushner plan, if it exists, has been postponed because of the Israeli election and we're now going to have a third try at the Israeli election, that then gets us into the US election calendar. Do you see any possibility of the US presenting this plan before President Trump leaves office? It's a very long century. I think our American friends must really work hard um, on any proposal that they put forward, if and when they put it uh, forward. And should they show you um, that proposal? And, You're and supposed to be the international community's man in charge of this. Well, I, it's, it's up to them if they want to show it to us. I would prefer very much, and we've, we've said this um, often enough, is that whatever proposal is put forward, um, that it be shared with um, uh, the, the quartet, which includes the UN, the uh, Russians and the European Union, um, that we all feed into it so that there's some ownership of it. Um, that it's consulted with Arab countries uh, who are critical uh, for any implementation, whether it's from the economic perspective or to the political um, uh, prospects of it, um, and that it's done in a way that it actually brings the sides together. Um, if, if that happens, whether in the beginning of the century, in the middle of the century, or the end of the century, I'd be all for it. Um, but we haven't seen that um, at this stage, and it's, it's very speculative to say what the plan includes because none of us have actually um, read it. We've had many discussions and, and, and we've exchanged lots of views and ideas on um, what and how it should be, should be in it. As you look at the situation on the ground, and I think it's pretty clear that it is deteriorating, you sit in your office, used to be called Government House, an old colonial building on the green line between what was described as East and West Jerusalem. You can see buildings that have been built illegally, I'm sure, from your office there with the sunken garden. Um, tell me, as you look out on that settlement building, how the pace of those settlements has changed. Let's just choose one time period, the last three years. How's it changed? I would say it's been it's been fairly consistent. It's increased, perhaps, in terms of um, announcements by the government of plans to build settlements. Um, but in terms of the construction rate, it's been pretty steady um, um, over the last few years. Um, it is, um, you know, it, it's a very, uh, you know, because of the Israeli election cycle. Now we're into the third election in, in just over a year. Um, it's one of the most politicized uh, issues, if you wish, because some uh, political parties believe that more announcements in terms of settlement construction, etc., wins them votes um, in upcoming elections. Um, and, and I think this drives a lot of the narrative in, in, in that sense. Um, where I see a danger coming up rather, rather quickly, um, that is in debates which we've heard over the last few, few months of the possible annexation of the Jordan Valley and uh, Northern Dead Sea area. Now, um, if, if that would happen, that would certainly go against all bilateral agreements, all UN Security Council and other resolutions, and, and pretty much you know, all aspects of international law, and it would not be constructive um, at all, because it would certainly create an environment in which um, the very prospect of a solution, which is so much under threat these days, and, 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 and uh, people are fearful that it's slipping from us, as you said in the very beginning, you know, there's, there's practically no peace process. Um, if, if that were to happen, um, it's, I'm not sure we can preserve that prospect. But this is an idea that Prime Minister Netanyahu's even come up with a map. It shows that they would annex 22, 23 percent of the West Bank. But it's not just him. His rival Benny Gantz is also talking uh, in favor of the idea of annexation. It seems that whoever, uh, if it's one of those two, is elected as Prime Minister, this is something you're going to have to face. 
well, you know, between words and deeds, there's um, um, uh, quite a few steps to take and, and, and a lot of complications in between. Now we're in a third election cycle in Israel, so I expect a lot of things to be said. Um, but I do also expect all of um, um, us to understand that if we want to preserve peace in a very volatile region um, of the Middle East, um, the whole region is, is quite volatile these days, we need to make the extra effort not to create um, um, the reasons for further radicalization and for further um, angering of, 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 of people, whether that's in the West Bank, um, whether it's in Gaza, which is currently very much our, um, um, our focus, um, or anywhere else for that uh, matter. Has not the Israeli government, current Israeli government, in fact the whole um, Israeli political elite been encouraged in all this, empowered by the Trump administration. When earlier on I said three years, the last three years, you've seen an increase. It seems to me, to me, the figures I've seen, and I'm looking at statistics from Peace Now, quite a, um, a large increase in the last three years. That's the three years since President Trump's been in power. Well, I suppose, you know, there are some people in Israel who do feel that the fact that the, this US administration has sided, you know, 100% with Israeli positions on a number of issues, whether it's settlements or the annexation of the Golan or, the, uh, or, or, or moving the embassy to Jerusalem, etc. I suppose that that encourages some people in Israel to think that um, they can do more. But also ultimately, um, if one stops for a second and looks around, you have two million Palestinians in Gaza and what, three million in the West Bank? They're not going anywhere. Um, as much as Israel has the right to have a state in, this, in the land between the river and the, um, um, and the sea, so do they. Um, and if you think that in the future you could have some formula which actually denies them not just that right, but denies them the, um, the very um, uh, rights that citizens in any democratic state, you either end up with um, um, a state in which your democracy is undermined, um, or you end up in a state in which um, ultimately, you know, uh, well, you know, it, it, you can't call it a democratic state. Would that be anymore. an apartheid system? And I think would you say? that's that's where a lot of Israelis are thinking now these days. That well, indeed, if you the current status quo, uh, which is far less violent than many other parts of the region, but still unstable and and and, and moving. Um, in a negative direction. If the current status quo were changed um, to a situation in where you have uh, citizens of, who have different rights, that's not a good thing. Do you fear that it could become an apartheid-like system? It's not for me to label what happens. It's um, my reflection on what I hear from people in Israel of the fears that they have um, for the future. Um, and I hope that actually we will be able to, 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 to get back into what is, the, what is, what is the, the right track to address this, this, this issue. You've mentioned some of the recent actions by the Trump administration. They recently have overturned 40 years of U.S. policy and said settlements, well, they're not necessarily illegal. They there are taking a position that goes against international law. Would you say that's definitely the case? Oh, that's yes. That's what we've said to the Security Council quite quite clearly, and the Secretary General has been very outspoken on that. Um, that indeed, even if uh, the future of settlements is an issue of negotiation, they, um, uh, their expansion, their existence, their um, development is against um, uh, UN Security Council resolutions and hence international law. And then them uh, annexing part of the Golan again. Mm -hmm. That is a violation of international Absolutely, law. Absolutely, yes. Okay, and the recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Again, would you say that is a violation of well, international the, the law? The recognition of Jerusalem as Israel's capital by the, the, the US is taking a position on one of the final status issues as they've been de defined by the Israelis and Palestinians for, for a very long time. Um, and the final status issues include the, uh, Jerusalem and, 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 and settlements indeed, and. Um, um, uh, borders and, and uh, based on the 67 line and, and access to water and refugees and all of these issues. So when, when um, the U.S. changed its position um, in terms of Jerusalem, um, as in all of these other examples that you quoted, it didn't change what the international consensus is. Because if you go to the Security Council meetings, 
um, which we have monthly on this, uh, on this subject, um, and you hear the rest of the Security Council members, and you look at the votes in the General Assembly, and you look at you know, the discussions in Europe, etc., elsewhere, in the Arab world certainly, um, um, the consensus is still there. The future, of, the future status of Jerusalem has to be decided in negotiation. Let's move, we've, we've talked a lot about the Americans and the Israelis, let's talk about the Palestinians. And there's endless talk of trying to get um, the two Palestinian groups together. There's talk of elections. Do you see any progress at all? Well, I see progress in the talks. Um, I'm still skeptical that elections will happen. And I'm very much fearful that this division which has existed between Gaza and the West Bank, between Fatah and Hamas, and, and for, for, for what, 13 years now? I'm, I'm sorry to say it, it's like a cancer. Um, it's a cancer eating away at the very Palestinian national cause. And, and I hope that now, after uh, all the discussions, all the efforts that we put in place to prevent another war in Gaza, um, and all the work that we've done to get Fatah and Hamas to make compromises on the road to elections, that we will actually see um, a vote um, in Palestine that elects a new legislative council and elects a new uh, presidential leadership. Um, this is the agreement. Um, and this is a promise that President Abbas made, um, and, 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 and this is a promise that needs to be delivered upon. How could the Palestinian cause change if there was one, unity, and two, younger, more vibrant leadership? President Abbas is 84 years old. He is currently serving the 15th year of what was supposed to be a four-year term. Um, there's no legislative council, which was uh, uh, disbanded recently. Um, there are issues with the judiciary. Um, and, and Finances you know, are a problem? Finance is a very serious problem. Um, if you actually manage to get back into sort of a normal democratic election cycle through elections, um, then, then at least the legitimacy of the institutions will not be questioned. Um, and a government that is elected both by the people in the West Bank um, um, and in Gaza will have the legitimate claim and will need our support to be able to govern both. Um, I think that will be a fundamental change to the equation um, uh, right now. I fear that if we leave things unattended the way they are now, um, uh, there'll be just more illusion, more, more, more anger, more disillusionment with the future. And, 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 and I'm really, really fearful, and I say this very carefully, that, that if you look at the rest of the Middle East, if you look at Iraq, for example, if you look at Syria, leave, if you leave a community long enough marginalized and, and, and disempowered and, and, and disenfranchised and segregated and, and, and closed, that community collapses and becomes breeding ground for radicals. Do um, you fear we another don't, war? We don't want to see that happening uh, in Palestine. Do you fear I another fear war another in Gaza? Because we've, 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 we've seen three wars since 2008. In November, there was a couple of days of very serious violence. Do you fear that there could be another war in Gaza? I fear every single day that we're just days away from another um, a war in Gaza. Um, I hope that we can, we can, you know, the, the calm that we have now, the relative calm that we have now, we can use to, 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 to consolidate what's been achieved in, over the last few, uh, over the last year, um, and, and move away from this constant cycle of fearing that every week, every Friday, every Monday, an incident may happen and it may drag us all back into another um, devastating conflict. Um, that conflict will not just be terrible for the people living in Gaza, extremely damaging for the people who live uh, in Israel, particularly around the communities around Gaza. But, but, but really, um, I, I think really devastating for the rest of the region. It's now 27 years since the Oslo process started. That was a time of great hope. As you now look at the situation, which you follow and monitor so closely every single day, can you tell me one sign of hope even? Well, we're still there, uh, and I don't mean we as the UN, 
Um, but uh, the people who have really, really invested in this quarter of a century that you've just um, quoted in building institutions. Um, you know, one, I went to Ramallah, um, uh, maybe this was more than a year ago, for some, for some meeting and people were getting very angry and saying, well, you know what, we'll just throw away the keys and, and invite the Israelis to come back and take it all over, etc., etc. Um, you know, you're not renting an apartment. Um, it's your own land. You don't just throw away the keys. Um, the amount of effort that has been made in, in moving from um, where the PLO was when the uh, Oslo agreements were signed to actually building up state institutions and functioning state institutions is immense. And it's an immense achievement for the Palestinian people. They can't give up on that. They shouldn't give up on that. And we as the international community shouldn't give up on that. Nikolai Mladenov, UN Special Coordinator for the Middle East Peace Process, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera.